You want to just start the stream whenever. I'll just go. Or if it's already been streaming this whole thing, then hello, Twitch. What's up? How's it going? Uh, it has been streaming this whole time. Okay, good. They need this. This is, this is part of the essence of the talk. That is also part of the essence of the talk. Okay. Um, well, welcome to How to Make Audio for Games and Not Die. I'm Matthew Hopkins, a professional music composer, sound designer, and living person. And I wanted to tell you how you can hold those jobs and also maintain your status of being alive, preferably simultaneously. In a job interview, I'm Matthew Hopkins, but online I am Too Mellow, a stage name from my high school rap career that is stuck and continued to describe me. Here's the raw numbers on me. Uh, music composer for 15 years since I was 13, and I played it a few years before that. Um, I was just recently uh, was did sound design for the first time on a uh, project where I jumped into a chance to do double duty as the musician and sound designer, and I later worked as a voiceover director for an update on the same game. Again, uh, this pattern in my life of jumping in headfirst to new opportunities that I was pretty sure I could do, not 100%. Um, and I want to be brief about what I've done for now, but here is a pictorial representation of the things I've done. Uh, the most popular one, the popularity is represented by how large they are, so it's like a minimalist art piece of my life. Uh, Chrono Jigga, uh, the front page of Reddit, Jay-Z, and Chrono Trigger remix album, which didn't make me a dime, but did kind of give me the connections I needed to make many dimes later. Um, there's my work on 2064 Read Only Memories, which is the queer cyberpunk adventure game inspired by Hideo Kojima's Sega CD classic Snatcher. And there's Cerebral, a 2D tag team fighting game inspired by Marvel superheroes vs. Street Fighter with the jazzy, funky hip-hop aesthetic of games like Third Strike, Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and the Jet Set Radio series. So in this talk today, I want to cover the pros and cons of working in the game industry, where to find work and uh, the networks that can get you connections to get that work, how and why to avoid inactivity when you're not working on projects so or you're in between or before a project, and the work-life balance of being a freelancer, that's the not die part. This talk will mainly be focused on getting your start by approaching independent developers and joining a small team. I don't really want this talk to be about like, teaching you how to create music and sound, as there's an assumption that you might have already looked into that yourself, but there will be a Q&A portion where I will answer anything you want about that. Um, so let's start off with the good stuff, the pros of working in the game industry. Firstly, it's a great way to take a passion for music that you already have and turn it into a career without having to like hit as a solo artist or get a job in a studio or work your way from the ground up in some other way, though having already made a name for yourself does definitely help. Uh, getting solid contract work and being paid by your rates that you set uh, was better than worrying about record sales for me, so I chose to go this route. Um, second thing, there's so many opportunities to start in the indie community. Um, actually, too many too many indie games out there, and the variety and amount kind of allows you to be choosy about your projects, so you can actually pick something that you want to work on rather than, you know, uh, feeling like you only have to take this certain kind of job or so on. Um, working with indies can have some pitfalls, which I'm definitely going to get to later, but generally it's a really cool way to get your first experience as it can be more laid back and comfortable than uh, suddenly getting a 9 to 5 in audio. Uh, one indirect positive of working in the games industry is that you're going to meet a bunch of artist programmers, designers, writers, people from other artistic backgrounds that can teach you about like kind of how they got to where they are, and you can teach them vice versa. Um, I've really enjoyed many people that are as passionate as me but come from like completely different backgrounds, and figuring out like their pet peeves, their loves and hates will help you on like, any team you work on in the future because there will be people filling their roles and you'll know how to better behave around those people. Uh, lastly, this is the obvious one, you get to work in games. Uh, if you play games, you'll be getting closer to something you love. It's an obvious plus. If you don't play games, they are a fascinating medium that will likely win you over soon. It's kind of where a bunch of different kinds of art and science converge. It's pretty impressive. Uh, cons of working in the game industry. Uh, it's sometimes hard to find steady paid work, which is absolutely true for any artistic pursuit when it intersects with finances. Um, on your way to a full-time industry job, you might have to string together a few smaller jobs. Um, there are indies out there who will not be able to pay you or uh, not immediately be able to pay you. You would get rejected a lot, a lot. I get like four rejection letters a week, 
It's just how it is. Um, but I'm getting th those four rejection letters because I applied to like 10 places, you know. Uh, games are very hard to finish, like harder than anyone almost can understand who hasn't made one. Extremely difficult to ship, which is the industry term. And having a shipped game in your portfolio is very important because it shows people that you've made it through the, the ultimate time of stress of completing a game and getting it out there, getting it on a storefront. It can be extremely disappointing when a game falls apart before it hits the finish line, but you can still take the pieces and put them up on your portfolio. And if the contract allows, you might even be able to repurpose that stuff for something later. Um, if you're a player of games, working on them will absolutely affect how you play them. This can be a pro or con, depending on how attached you are to the hobby. Uh, your experience will give you a different perspective on how your favorite games are made and either give you more understanding or more frustration about these things. <laughs> For example, now that I know how easy it is to place sounds realistically in a 3D space, like behind walls, make them sound a little muffled, I'm like really furious when the AAA game Fallout 4 has NPCs and enemies sounding like they're right next to me when they're three floors above me in a building, when I know they could just put a filter on that. Working in games will also make you want to play games less, uh, since you spend so much time in them already. Uh, or you could just have less time to play them, as could be the case if you're doing this around a part or full-time job. Um, the games industry is also young and odd. It's prone to shakeups. Just recently, the SAG after voice actor strike has been um, an example of this that might, might destabilize some, some franchise voice actors for, the next, for games produced in the next year. Um, the industry is shifting towards mobile gaming, long-term multiplayer experiences, and ways to monetize those experiences. We're slightly moving away from these big-budget tempo releases, and like the middle-tier stuff is all but gone. We're even moving away from console generations, as we see consoles like PlayStation and Xbox making small iterations on their existing products instead of working towards fully new ones. Uh, there's problems like crutch, uh, crunch, the industry term for overworking. There's a lack of diversity in employees at big studios. There's immature storytelling in an industry that was born without full-time storytellers and just had to find a way to walk. Uh, these things still show us how far we have to go, and I could do a talk about each one of these problems alone, but we're here for audio. Enough talk about the industry in general. Let's get specific. How do you find these jobs? Well, I'd suggest looking at uh, positions that have been posted and reviewing indie teams that are asking for audio help. Even job postings you aren't yet qualified for will kind of show you what companies look for. It's a good idea to look at their recommended, like their wish list of things they want and then the things they absolutely need. Because if you don't have those things, you need to get on it. Uh, even job postings you aren't yet qualified for, you can apply for them. There's no rules. Um, and as for places to go, Orca HQ has made it very easy for me to have this conversation. There would be like five more sites here if they weren't here. But they have kind of centralized the effort of game job postings. If you go to Orca, you can find like everything in one place for, for the uh, larger company postings. Um, they just centralize them, uh, and they don't really require you to sign up or anything. You can just click on the job postings and go straight to where they are. Uh, game Dev Map is a good tool for scoping out jobs in particular locations or looking at companies uh, in that area that you might be planning to move to to kind of see what the vibe is, see how many or how few places there are. Um, so it's really handy for if you were going to move out somewhere, figuring out where you might want to work. Um, and also just seeing what is out there in general, like I do cold calling on a massive scale because I can just go to Game Dev Map and just pick things out of a list because it's all there. Um, Reddit has some possible resources. They're often just a source of amusement for me. It's like non-paid looking for artists for 7,000 assets for my survival game. Please hit me up at my email. And um, there are barely ever any audio jobs being posted there, but you can put yourself up for hire and see what comes your way. Uh, and I also recently found, as I was making this presentation, uh, r slash INAT, which is I need a team. And this is people forming teams on the ground level. And it lets you get in on a project before it's even like really started, which is something that you kind of don't really get to do uh, when you're scoping out this stuff usually. Um, and you can use any job site really, like Indeed, Monster, Career Finder, once you know the right keywords to put in. Uh, examples of what a sound designer job might be. Could be audio designer, could be sound designer, could be audio lead, could be technical sound designer. Um, you should, as you, as you look at stuff on Orca, you should kind of 
logged mentally what these companies are calling these jobs, so you can go look for them on other sites. Orca might not have caught everything. So let's talk about networking, which I think is really even more important than looking for a job because this can just get you that job. Um, for example, my free project, Chrono Jiga, ended up getting people to contact me, and some of those people ended up making games later on and asked me to join their teams. That's kind of how I got started. The number one place to network as a game industry professional is Twitter. Uh, game Dev Twitter is active at any hour of the day with uh, developers, journalists, entertainers, and players of games all taking part. You can find out who to follow by simply searching game industry personalities to follow on Twitter. That's what I did, and I'm all up in this beautiful mess now. If you're interested in games yourself, it shouldn't take too long to figure out who you want to continue following and interacting with once you get past like that base level of here are the uh, normal people to follow. Don't follow Notch. He was on that list. That was a mistake. Don't follow Notch. Being hooked into game dev Twitter can help you uh, read the movement of the industry and be one of the first pairs of eyes on new jobs being posted or public calls for freelancers that can happen. Uh, the Indie Game Developers Facebook group is is hilarious. It's like a stand-up comedy routine of indie games, but it's also can be very useful and illuminating at times, and a lot of interesting games can get posted on there. It's a chance to become friends with someone who um, is posting a neat game, maybe talk to them more about what they do. Um, it will also come into handy for something that I'm going to mention a little later on. Um, the Game Audio Slack is a group of people who work in game audio who use the Slack chat channel and team integration app to talk about industry happenings, new techniques, and share work. Um, it's a little overwhelming because it's just a chat channel that kind of constantly flows, and as people talk, things get bumped down. But it can help to kind of get a who's who of game audio, and if you're about to go to an event and want to meet some people, you can just post in there and say, like, hey, who's going to be at BitBash Chicago or what have you? Um, you get in there by invitation from Matt Esk, and if you just search Game Audio Slack in Twitter, you will be led to a tweet that he is involved in, for sure. I tested it. Um, hashtags are used sarcastically a lot, but these two are ones I would take seriously. Hashtag Game Audio and Screenshot Saturday can be used in like any social network that uses hashtags, and you'll find some good posts under these. Um, Screenshot Saturday is, is like a tradition in the indie community of posting like screenshots, videos, concept arts of your game on Saturday with the hashtag. Um, this would be really good in the being involved in the indie game developers Facebook group. You're going to see a lot of these posts. Um, some of these uh, guys might be really, really early in their production of their game, but if you see something cool, it wouldn't hurt to reach out and attempt contact. You never know. And you could do that tomorrow. Tomorrow's Saturday. How convenient. Last but not least, Attending game industry events and local meetups can be great. Uh, it can also be expensive as hell, uh, especially one that I have gone to, which is GDC, uh, the Game Developers Conference. It's in San Francisco, so not only is it like $1,000, you have to pay $12 for a slice of pizza. Um, BitBash Chicago is a smaller, like really neat, focused indie event that was really nice. Um, and even Lex Play, this is a gaming event we're at right now. Um, there are many developers right here in the building helping run this. And, of course, the Internet also exists. So if you can't get out to events right away, don't feel too bad. You can start meeting people online right now. Sign up for my dating site. Now, my most important point in this entire presentation, do not work for free. Do not work for exposure. Do not work to like do someone a solid. Never, ever, ever join a commercial project with it being understood by the person who hired you that you don't expect payment. That's so bad. Up front, you've got to expect to be paid. You've got to mention it as soon as you can, just to see where everybody's at. Uh, I say commercial project here because I don't want to like, say that you can't work for free on a project with your friend or a fan project or something you're doing for yourself. Um, that's totally fine. but. Never let anyone tell you on a commercial project or on a non-commercial project that you have to be making stuff for free just because it's non-commercial either. Like, for example, bro, please make some beats for my mixtape. It's promoting my event, and I'm not making any money off it, so you got to do this for free for me. No, you don't. You really don't. Don't make beats for that person's mixtape. This decreases your own value. This person you'll work for free for, they'll never pay you. They'll tell other people you don't expect to be paid, 
if people you worked for in the future saw a public post of yours saying you would do work for free from like way long ago, they're going to try to not pay you. Offering free work will potentially haunt you your entire career. And this goes for all art, not just music, by the way. Once you hand over some work for free, the other team members aren't going to handle it with the same respect and care as something you paid for. Uh, think about it as uh, comparing like your parents buying you a car and you working really hard at a minimum wage job for like two years to save up for a car. There's one car that you're going to respect a lot more than the other one and take care of a lot better. Uh, once you tell someone you as an artist will work for free, that really increases the chance that this person is going to try to get other artists to do the same thing. They're like, well, this guy did it, so you not only made the future of this work relationship harder for yourself, you've made it harder for every artist that is going to have to try to get their dues from this person down the line. Um, and you may think, of course, this is like the biggest thing that I get right up front when I say this, you may think offering your services for free at first is a way to get some work, to like get some heat on you, get your stuff in the resume, foot in the door. It could be, but as stated, it's really not good for your future. I, I have personal experience with this, unfortunately. Um, I offered production services to a really popular musician here in town, actually. And uh, I thought it would be a really good way to get my foot in the door, but before I knew it, I had my foot caught in the freaking door, and I couldn't move forward, I couldn't back out, I'm stuck in the door. And the day that I started asking for payment was the day that that promising relationship, the chance at exposure, the popular musician just disappeared into thin air, off to find some other talented, desperate person willing to work for free. So just stop this problem at the door. Uh, don't work for people who aren't going to pay you. Don't let them have your, their cake and eat it too. Well, I guess it technically is your cake. Uh, even if you don't believe your work is worth paying for, if you have some insecurities about being paid, just force yourself to ask for like some small amount to have something on the books, something. At the same time, please also remember to pay anyone you have worked for you. <laughs> no double standards. Uh, album cover illustrators, graphic designers, people who might be hired to mix and master your album, they also need to be paid. Um, I want to take a moment to go over some best practices for approaching and negotiating with indie teams. Uh, another thing that I could do an entire talk on alone if I wanted to. Uh, firstly, when you're sending that first message, don't be afraid to show all your passion for your project. Really gush, as I said before in my pros of working in games. Uh, the really benefit of indies is that you're probably going to, there's so many things, somebody's doing something you love, and you might find that, and you might really be able to just put your heart out to them. Try to show these devs that you are, can be as passionate as they are, because the driving force for them is probably... You know, it's probably not money. It might not even be support of the people they know. It's their own love for what they're making. So if they see that shared trait in you, it's very positive, I feel. At the same time, you should demonstrate professionalism. Show them you are to be respected. Try to start negotiations about terms of payment as soon as possible. You know, let them know that's what you expect. Scope out the time frame they're working in, because you want to work with a team that has their stuff together. Um, figure out what they ultimately expect to do. And don't be afraid to tell them what you think about their goals. I wouldn't be critical, because people are probably doing that to them already. Uh, if they're doing something you don't really think will pan out, it would be, would be more productive to, if you feel uneasy about proceeding with them, give them some gentle advice about what they could change to bring you and other artists on board. Don't be afraid to be really creative in applying. Uh, for example, I was recently asked to make one or two short spec music tracks to apply to work on a game. That's like stuff that might not actually be in the game, but it's just like my idea of what the game stuff might sound like. Uh, the story of this game is about like a creepy in-world board game, uh, which is appropriate for Halloween. One night I got a neat idea and created a short TV commercial style, like 90s commercial jingle for the board game. And I sent it over to the team. Uh, and I think little fun things like that can show the team that you would be a good person to have in like the times of stress. The fact that you can just kind of like pop off something inspired that gets everybody going again. Um, the one thing that indie developers are often lacking, I might as well just say always, I'm, I'm editing that out right now, I'm saying always lacking, is money. The luckiest of them will have enough of it to pay their artist right off. Most will have a plan to latch crowdfunding to adequately pay everybody. On a project, any project, it's helpful for the developers to know exactly what their workers are going to need. Once negotiations have proceeded to a certain point, one thing you can do is like draw up a budget plan detailing to your best knowledge what you will want to be paid for the project, what you will have to pay for yourself to do the stuff you want to do, and why you think you should be paid that much. Explain how long it would take you to create the 10 or 15 tracks of music. 
explain what you might need for the sounds or uh, how long it might take you to make those as best you can with what information they have given you. Another important thing to figure out later on is whether you will be able to sell the music or not independently. You should really try to keep those rights. Uh, the ideal is that you can just sell it on your Bandcamp or Louder, Spotify, iTunes uh, after the game is released. That's a continuing stream of revenue. It's extremely valuable. Uh, especially if the game remains popular or if it becomes like a late life hit uh, when maybe the, the people who made it have it on the Steam sale for a dollar or something, but your soundtrack's still eight bucks. Um, it also gets people to come to your site and dig into the rest of your music. So really, 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 really fight hard to have the rights to distribute the soundtrack. Make sure that is in your contract. Um, it may even be worth taking a little pay cut somewhere else. I've actually uh, had a deal worked out with Read Only Memories, the publisher and developer of that game, where as long as I have like the soundtrack appear in the Steam bundle with an art book, or the, the Humble Bundle bundle, that's actually a thing, with the art book, uh, then they'll kind of let me post it independently on my other sources and get all the money from that. Um, so, I wanna now talk about how to keep yourself sharp before you necessarily have solid work to do or between having work. First and most important thing, never stop learning and working. Um, this is something I've been doing recently because I've kind of been between bigger projects. If there are programs, techniques, in these recommended wish lists of job descriptions that you have seen, you should absolutely learn those things, get that resume bolstered as much as you can. Um, most game audio middleware is extremely easy to use if you've ever used a digital audio workstation. It's like most of it's free or like demos uh, that are fully functional. Um, there's tons of tutorials out there. Hey, turns out the internet is all right sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, you can even start learning game engines on your own if you're that ambitious. Uh, Unity is a really good place to start. It's a free game engine. Uh, it doesn't require you to learn C++ right off the bat. So that means it's good. <laughs> Developers uh, will really appreciate you knowing their programs. Uh, also, never stop polishing the skills you already have. Um, make sure you have side projects going at all times, little musical things to keep you going. Even if there's something that never reaches completion, make music and sound as often as you can. Why? Because when a company is interested, you don't want to look like you were just sitting around the whole time. You want to have new, chef, new stuff to show all the time. You want to have like what you did last month. You want to show that you have the personal drive to always keep turning out new material, even if it hasn't been commissioned. You know, why wait until you have a task to do? I kind of had this epiphany. If you, if you want to work on some, some dream game like a JRPG, but you can't find a, game, uh, a job to work on that JRPG, why don't you just start making JRPG music? Just make up your own imaginary game and use it to showcase your work. Just make 10 or 20 tracks for it. Uh, use that in a portfolio somewhere. You can uh, do some, you can rescore uh, one of your favorite game trailers or a movie scene. You can do sound design for a movie scene. That's something I've been thinking of doing recently. Um, just anything to keep yourself sharp and make sure that your skills don't fall by the wayside. Um, and I spoke earlier about the game industry being an alternative to the classic method of profiting as a musician, releasing albums, that sort of thing. Luckily, it's not an either or, and you can still totally do that on the side. Um, so get those new financial avenues, keep them open, release little albums every now and then to be like little cash earners to unexpectedly help you out in the times you need them. Think about signing up to create royalty-free sounds and music for online libraries like Audio Jungle or seeking audio work for non-game clients. That's always a thing you can do. Like indie films or solo musicians needing songwriters or producers. Any game work you've done can even bounce back and help you get jobs in other areas. It's happened for me. Um, so. Let's talk about not dying. In the past few years, I've made some risky choices as an artist, leaving my day job, going independent, putting my life on the line, and telling myself that my art is good enough for me to eat and pay some bills off it. For almost two years, I've lived as an independent artist. I'm currently looking at fully, uh, moving into a full-time industry job, but I want to offer you some advice gleaned from this time of independence that I will never forget. This advice mostly applies to working as an independent musician, but it could also totally be applied to um, times when you're working a full-time or part-time job and trying to do an artistic pursuit on the side. Um, in fact, taking a little time to work completely for yourself will really teach you a lot about your schedule and how you work best as a person. Uh, first off, have a plan for explaining to everyone near and dear to you 
what you're about to do. Be ready to listen to all the complaints and criticisms of your plan. Do what you need in order to keep your focus, but try not to shut anyone out. You will regret it later. For example, I could not imagine pursuing this dream, could not have pursued this dream without the help of my parents, whom I eventually wore down into accepting the fact that, yes, this is what I'm really going to do. Yes, Mom, I'm really going to do it. Um, <laughs> after several years and bigger and bigger paychecks, they were like, fine, whatever, just figure out how to do your taxes. Um, and what you're about to do, you're going to kind of test those relationships more than they ever have been before. And just make sure those people know that they're important to your plan, even if they don't like it. They might end up being a, a life raft for you. So don't call a person a life raft. That's a little rude. Second most important thing, have a few backup plans. When I have been in dire straits, I plan ahead by saying, okay, if I don't have anything by this month, I'm going to do like a little funding drive or sell something that's really important to me to get to where I need to be. And if that doesn't get me where I'm going, I might have to get a day job, uh, which is the ultimate backup plan, defeat. <laughs> um, I haven't reached that point yet uh, since leaving my last day job. Just don't keep pushing if pushing is going to get you into a dangerous place. Uh, fall back and regroup for your health and your life. It's always more valuable to take some time to plan in a place where you can be comfortable than it is to keep aggressively jumping into something in dangerous ways. Third most important thing, have a task manager. Um, Asana is my favorite one for free personal use. Trello is good for projects. Basically what I do with Asana is I set tasks and projects for every little thing like project, album, project, life stuff. And under life stuff, I even like task my own haircuts and stuff. Like just stuff I need to go do. Um, from, from the biggest to smallest task, I always want to have an Asana so I don't have to think about stuff if I'm floundering after I've woken up and I don't know what I need to do today. I just look at Asana and I'm like, oh, okay, I can do this, this, and this. It's saved my butt so many times. It has a web and desktop client. It has a phone app, so you can pretty much access it from anywhere. Next, uh, schedule yourself logically uh, in a way that makes sense for you personally. Uh, now that you have the freedom, you know, if you're on a morning person, don't feel the need to suddenly just start getting up in the morning and doing a 9 to 5. Uh, you can wake up at like 10 or 11 and start your day then if that's the way you work better, but just be prepared to work later into the night to compensate. I usually get between four and eight hours of straight work um, done a day. I've heard that's actually kind of high for creative work. Most people say like three to six is what they expect to get. Because sometimes it's blood from a stone, for real. Um, sometimes I do much more. I think my longest day ever was 16 hours of work. And after that, I watched like one episode of anime and I passed out immediately. I don't recommend that. Watching anime, I mean. Uh, balancing your time enjoying yourself and your time working can be odd because you can find yourself slipping into work or play unconsciously at almost any time during the day, especially if you also use your computer for recreation. You're like one click away from like messing around with something that is not going to help you. One of the things that has been best for me is having um, distinct places in my room or even distinct rooms, if you can do that, for work and play. For example, if, my, if I'm bringing my computer over to my bed, that means, okay, I'm going to mess around now. I'm, I'm uh, going to watch a video or um, maybe even play a game or something. Maybe even play a game. Think about that. That's how I think of games. Um, but if I'm, I can't do any work over there. That's illegal. I've got to bring the computer back over the desk if I'm going to do work. And that's, that's, what, that's how I work it out. I could talk about the scheduling aspect for hours because I'm still figuring it out in some ways. Lastly, this is a really dumb thing I forgot about my first year. At some point, government's going to want some of that sweet video game money. You have to break it off a little bit. One cool thing about doing your taxes when you work in the game industry is that you can write off game purchases. They count as being vital for your career. You can write off console purchases. Basically, when you're, I could write off like a PlayStation Move purchase. I might do that. I might do that. Basically, when you're self-employed, you need to keep a much closer eye on the purchases you make. All, anything that can be possibly tied to your work, um, you can really save yourself a lot of trouble during tax season. Luckily, I had a computer I could deduct, and that helped me out a lot. Um, so really, that is all I have uh, for, the, for the talk today. I'm going to leave all my information up here. Um, and I want to post this very shortly after on, on my Twitter, on my website, on Facebook. So if you didn't write anything down, don't worry. Um, I'm going to post the, 
the phone that I'm secretly reading. There's text on it. I'm going to post that text um, on, the, on the online, and I'm also going to post these slides. But uh, I would love to hear some questions for everybody about anything relating to music and sound, not just the getting work aspect. I'm going to stare at you. I'm going to stare at you. Okay, no, I'm going to ask you questions. Okay, raise your hands if you have made a piece of music before. Yeah. Brandon knows what's up. Raise your hands if you would, if you feel you could make a piece of music or would like to. Okay, if you would like to. That's too much pressure. Could is too much pressure. All right. Anything you're curious about regarding that? Like what, what software to use? Okay, that's the, yeah. I, I feel I'm in my comfort zone now. That's the question I usually get immediately. I just, that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. I get, mark one off in the book. Okay, what software I use? Um, I use Ableton Live, which is, oh, I can put it up. I'm on my computer. Um, Ableton Live is a digital audio workstation, um, which is just, Essentially, it has everything you would need to make music inside it. It has instruments inside it. It has keeps time for you. A little metronome that you can't hear. Um, it allows you to manage all your samples over here in the corner. Um, basically, you're going to need one of these. There's quite a few uh, digital audio workstations, but they are quite easy to find. Some of them are even free to start, and really. You'll feel it out over time once you learn what they do, figure out which one is actually the best for you. Um, a lot of people, you will find a lot of people, it's just like the console wars or like uh, PC versus Mac. You're going to find a lot of people who say, oh, no, this is the best one. That's not really a thing. I mean, there are bad ones, but it's really, if, if you work really well on the bad one, then it's a good one for you. So that's just how it goes, kind of. Um, so yeah, digital audio workstations, there's many different types of them. So if you just type in DAW on Google, that is usually what they are known as on the internet. Uh, so inside this thing, I can start writing music on a piano roll in like seconds. Um, I can lay samples down in the grid. I can lay vocals down by recording. This button over here, just start playing music. Um, Computers have really revolutionized the way you make music, especially game music. Wouldn't want to be there back in the day when you had to enter like hex codes into a tracker. Um, so that is that. Uh, any more questions? Hey there, Zach. Well, I, I guessed your name, so I am pretty cool. My favorite sample libraries are, I can show you. Um, first of all, I use Native, Instrument Con Native Instruments Contact, which is an amazing sampler that has kind of become the industry standard. It's a little bit like they just took over and no one really had a choice to use anything else, a little bit. Um, my favorite libraries are my Neo Soul Keys right here. It's a collection of electric pianos that are really warm and nice. Um, I enjoy, <laughs> this is the worst name for a thing, but it's really good, Ethno World Instruments and Voices. It's like every, every world instrument you could possibly want and every world voice you could possibly want. Another bad name for a company this time, Audio Bro, LA Scoring Strings 2, uh, is, a, is a really, really good string library. It gives you a lot of expression. Um, and then the, there are these native instruments, instruments, session horns and session strings that are pretty low CPU intensive. Um, and I have these very, very, very realistic horn instruments, uh, the trombone, horn, and tuba, and I think I have a trumpet up here. Oh, God. Oh, saxophone. Oh, I didn't add the trumpet. Um, they're really expressive, and you can actually use them with a little breath controller thing that I'll probably never buy, but really neat. Um, aside from that, I use a bunch of like old hip-hop sample libraries. 
like uh, th these scratch samples that you hear. Like, uh, let me give an example. Like, run it, that sound. <laughs> or, um, this is the beat, y'all, of the year. Stuff like that. I like putting that stuff into music, uh, chopping it up. I like using vocals a lot. It's kind of one of my one of my trademarks of making stuff. I was going to play y'all some stuff, but I don't know if I have an audio hookup. I mean, I, no, I do know. I don't have one. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I, I typically have, like, one really good sample library that I like to use for each class of instrument. Um, this funk guitarist thing is really cool because you can just... You can just touch a key and it will start playing a chord of perfect funk. That sounds really powerful. A chord of perfect funk. I would like another question. Uh, could I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, the man behind the projector. Uh, are you trying to play sounds to them? Um, if I can, that would be cool. If okay. that can be done on the fly through this HDMI. But, uh, uh, it'll be delayed. Is that okay? Yeah. See if I can figure it out. Give me okay. a minute while you ask other questions. All right, just give me a shout when you can play them, and I'll play something. I had I had something ready actually, like an example of what I'd done. Um, here's my anime wallpaper. Uh, any more questions? Okay, um, Zach, what's your question? Yeah, Twitch.tv um, hashtag two mellow two mellow dot net. Yeah, uh, I would suggest going more for the type of music they want to make uh, than, than looking at all the things you could make the music with. It's extremely overwhelming. Uh, when I was younger, I bought so many synthesizers, and now I use like two of those. There's so many that I bought. And I ended up just paring it down over time because I realized what works for me with the kind of music I want to make. So the best thing to do, I've found, um, especially if they're working in game music, just take some of the game music that they know they really like and actually recreate that with the samples they have. And I think that might help them narrow down what samples to use, uh, is they'll realize, oh yeah, this, this piano is not anywhere near this other piano that I like in this song, so I probably don't want to go with that one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's extremely daunting. There's just so many out there. Um, some of my favorite samples that I get are from like this guy who runs a website and like personally sends you links, like download links when you, when you PayPal him. Uh, and he has all these really weird instruments he, he's tortured and destroyed uh, into making these really neat sounds. There's so much, and you never know. Uh, you can't really think about what you might be missing. It's kind of overwhelming. So it's, it's really best to like take what you have, uh, try to feel out the things that you want to make that you might have, like a goal song or something like, I want to make something like this someday. Uh, so just go for that and try to sound as similar to that as possible with what you got and keep remember what you used, kind of save it like good piano sound right here. Good piano sound, noting that. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I was able to pare myself down to what I like over time. Okay, I can't hear my guitar yet, so I guess. Oh, uh, we can try it out. I might need Epson default device. Huh. No. I hear my little guitar over here. Are you going to HDMI audio? Uh, HDMI. Ah, there's, there's one Epson PJ, which I assume must be a cool way that kids say projector. Um. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a bad idea. 
Um, <laughs> it's kind of loud over here. Um, yeah, it's it's still wanting to put. Oh, oh no. Okay, yeah, I know why. I know why. This guitar is about to be so loud. Um, I know why it's doing that. Because the program I was using was playing through the wrong output. It should definitely be going. It's going through the projector now. To the projector. See if you get anything. I just really want this guitar to start coming on real loud suddenly. Okay. It is playing. So now you guys get to see live audio production. The finale. Oh, well. oh, it was me. It was me. That's coming out of that projector. That's not what we want. That sounds horrible from here. It is. Yeah, how you liking that, Ian? It's good? It's good? Yeah. <laughs> this is fun. Okay. Um... It's really dumb. It's so dumb. Um, okay, I'm stopping now. Hear that beep over there? Okay, uh, let me try this one. I don't think that's coming from anywhere. I'm doing this for the benefit of the other presenters, really. This is. Mic check. Microphone check. No. Nope. I'm trying to do something really stupid, sorry. Almost everyone here knows me. You know, I like doing dumb stuff. I'll do it. Mic check. Check. No. Okay. Anyway, any more questions? Got a little time left. Yeah. Um, so I, when I started making sound effects, I only had experience in music mainly, um, generally in sound, but not specifically in the way that you represent something visually in a very short period of time. Like, I need to communicate to people what this sound is, what this feels like, just from them watching it. Uh, so initially what I did was try to use music, which I was familiar with, um, in synthesis especially, to figure out how to, how to um, display this stuff. Um, what I'm trying to say is I started with a game that was very retro styled uh, on the, it was based on the Genesis sound chip actually, it was the first game that I designed for. So it was actually really good for me because that meant most of my sounds had to be created by synths anyway. Um, so for short form sound effects, I usually put the video up here in Ableton with a representation of, this, of uh, what is going to be the sound. Let me see if I can actually pull one up. And I kind of loop it over and over again and make small iterations to the sound. That's why I do it. Um, be cool.
cool if I can actually show one. Yeah, okay. So there's a video for a uh, character from Cerebral doing a punch. Oh, hey, it's coming from the director. That's right. We did that. We did that. We did that. Um, and I have this epic sound. <laughs> Um, so what I would do is like loop a part of this video over and over again while setting these files. Let me see if I can actually sync it up real quick. I kind of like that. It's close. Hold on. Let me get it a little better. No, not quite. There we go. Um, so, yeah, essentially what I would do is just, probably sounds maddening people watching me do it, but I, or like, if someone was living with me while I'm doing this or something, just do it over and over again. So I play this animation, and I feel out what it needs. Um, and back here, I place the sounds appropriately. Tact element of the sound alone. Get that sorted out. Um, and I have the little snap when her hand goes back into her. Then I have the whooshes of energy. Funny thing about punches, it's not the actual punch impact sound that makes the weight, but it's the whoosh before the punch that is actually the important part. Um, then I have a little sound effect for the charge up. Uh, let's see. And there, there's a sound of a blowtorch popping that I used for the spikes coming out of the bracelet. And there's a little nail drop sound to make it sound a little sweeter. Uh, and I have a good wind up sound here. It's a body falling through glass or something ridiculous. Because that's what we do. It sounds fun. And I got all these sounds from different sample libraries that I use over time. I recorded some of them myself. Yeah. That's an example of how sound is made. Is there anything else cool? Yeah, this is cool. This might be cool. Oh yeah, this one doesn't actually have a video to it. Um, but it was another part of that attack that I used. Yeah, okay. So I think my time is almost up here, so I'll take another question if anyone has one. Yes. I think um, that you would use one of the resources like, can I pull this back up successfully? Um, like Reddit game jobs or um, the indie game developers Facebook group possibly um, could be a good place to find people. Um, and just the thing I would say above anything is to be to be very open and honest about uh, whether whether you can pay or whether it would be volunteer work, um, and to tell people as much as you possibly can about the game. Um, the ones that, the job postings that kind of turn me off when I see them are things where people almost feel like they don't know what their game is yet or, or they want me to explain to them what their game is. Um, so so the, the most substantial information you can get about your plan is good. Uh, definitely don't overwhelm somebody in the first post. Try to give them like a little bit more than your elevator pitch of what the game is. Um, and if you can talk about specific things that influence you or like any like a list of sound or music that you would need, that's always really good. Um, you will absolutely find people who, who will be willing to do a volunteer thing with you. I know I had the big rant about, um, about payment, but there's definitely a time where you just need to get on a project and get some stuff done, and you find people who also want to do the same thing. Uh, it can be like a beautiful moment of like bootstraps pulling from the ground up video game. Uh, so yeah, I, I would recommend uh, places where other people in similar situations might come. 
which is like the, the Reddit scene, uh, the Facebook indie game developers group scene. It's a, it's a lot of people who are, who are fledgling, uh, fledgling, like you said, in different parts of game development. So it might be a good place to find other people in a similar mindset. Yeah. So I have business cards, if anyone would like one. And they're new. No one has these except for me yet. They're exclusive. I just made them. But that's pretty much all of me. So uh, thank you all for attending. How to work in game audio and not die. I don't even know if that's word for word what it's called. Let's see if I got it right. Nope. How to make audio for games and not die. All right. Well, thank you very much. You want to see how much money I got? Business cards. I, I actually want those.